Okay, so we come to the uh, next question, and uh, uh, Ahmed Sami will be in the uh, candidates, uh, candidates chair now. So, uh, are you ready, Ahmed? Yes, I am. Okay, so we've got the 32-year-old lady who's had this painful hip now for more than five years, and she's come to you in the, the hip clinic. Um, how would you pre proceed to manage this case? Um, on looking on the x-rays, it looks like an AP ridge graft of a pelvis um, showing um, clear evidence of a standard dysplasia with superior migration of the humeral head and established um, NSH arthritis. Um, I'd want to first take history from the patient, ask her about her symptoms, um, the pain, the range of movement, uh, the impact on her daily activities and hobbies. And because it's a long-standing problem, I need to know what, what changed um, recently and what brought her to the clinic today. Um, I also want to know any history of um, previous um, surgeries. Then I'll proceed to the examination. Besides doing a, general, a quick general examination, I'll do a focused hip examination, um, focusing on uh, the range movement of the hip, uh, the limb length discrepancy between uh, uh, both um, sides, the rotational profile of the um, of the uh, femur in terms of the um, anti-virgin and rotation. Um, I would uh, also want to know about the um, uh, the strength of the abductor um, muscle, um, as this will um, influence uh, my decision. Um, so she's uh, she's been putting up with this for years now, and everyone's been telling her to try to cope with the pain, but now she's unable to do so. Uh, so she now seriously wants a hip replacement and um, in terms of examination wise she has yes she has about three centimeters shortening um, she has you're suspecting some excessive femoral antiversion um, she hasn't had previous surgeries on that side it was a missed diagnosis from childhood so now what are you thinking of what are you worried about this case in particular um, so with the standard dysplasia, you're obviously worried about the um, the bone stock and coverage um, on the astabular side, uh, as well as the abnormal uh, narrow uh, fe proximal femur on the femoral side. I would ideally want to uh, have a CT scan first um, to look um, onto to look into these um, deficiencies. Um, if possible, uh, I'll refer her to a center who, um, who's um, experienced in doing um, young um, adult um, hip. Um, what do you I'm think? Aware. I mean, imagine that you're in the center now, the experienced center. What do you think his, his concerns are and what he's planning on doing to address these? Um, so I think uh, he will try to restore the, uh, the anatomy and the center of rotation of the hip Ideally, um, he would try to uh, place the um, acetabular component in the um, true acetabulum. Uh, this, is, um, this is better than the false acetabulum in terms of um, better abductor function uh, and therefore less joint reaction forces. Um, it's better um, uh, bone uh, stock. It allows the length to, um, to be restored. Uh, however, doing that means that he has to address the, um, the deficiencies in the acetabulum uh, and will have to use um, um, bone graft, uh, most probably from the um, femoral head. What do you think he will, uh, 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 how much lengthening would he allow? Uh, I think the cutoff will be around three centimeters for the risk of uh, doing any nerve injury. Um, so if, um, if more than three centimeters is needed, um, uh, this probably will mean a uh, subtrochanteric uh, osteotomy, which increases the challenges uh, of the uh, surgery and uh, makes the femoral component even uh, a bit more difficult than normal. But, I mean, you mentioned the narrow femoral uh, canal. What do you think he would do to try to uh, accommodate for that? Uh, I think he has to use one of the DDH stems or the uh, modular of the custom made um, uh, ones, uh, which might have to be templated uh, beforehand uh, according to the um, according to the CT um, scan. Um, you mentioned also a rotational profile in your examination. What do you expect her uh, uh, rotational profile to be? Um, Normally, in these cases, I'd expect uh, uh, increased anti-virgin, uh, which will increase the risk of um, dislocation 
and uh, this has to be addressed uh, as well um, during uh, the surgery and during the placement of the uh, of the acetabular component as well as the uh, femoral component. Yes, I totally agree. Thank you. Okay, well done. Uh, what do you think? Um, I, I think uh, I think I've done well. Uh, apart from the fact I didn't use um, much evidence uh, when it came to the part of choosing the true and the false acetabulum. Uh, in retrospect, uh, I think an ideal answer would have involved um, evidence to support uh, bringing the hip, bringing the the center of the hip to the um, to the anatomical center as opposed to putting the acetabular component to in the, in the false acetabulum. Well, I think I mean I, I, I he didn't um, I mean he, he didn't ask you that question specifically. Uh, so I think if the question was why do you want to bring the head down? Then because you said you said everything you said that bringing it down you have better bone stock, bringing it down, you'll restore the leg length, bringing it down, you'll restore the abductor muscle function. Uh, and you said bringing it down, I think you said, will also give better longevity. And you said it from yourself, actually, without being asked, which is, which is a good thing. Uh, if it was a specific question, maybe you would have uh, added by giving some evidence, but I think you did uh, very well, yeah. Um, would you have said anything differently, Bigan? No, I think I think he did really well. Um, in the hands of most examiners, he would take a seven. Um, maybe maybe he needs some more evidence just to get an eight. Um, he did, demonstrated logical stepwise assessment of the case um, and assessing all the key points um, that he needs to know in order to give her the proper treatment. He had, he acknowledges that it's a challenging um, uh, situation. It's a challenging case, and and he's a safe surgeon. He would definitely refer her to the experienced uh, centers dealing with these kind of cases. Uh, but when prompted that if he's the experienced surgeon, he knows the logic and the rationale behind the treatment. He knows the difficulties on the establer and the femoral sides and, um, and how to manage them. Uh, a, a teasing question at the end would be, um, how would you consent this patient differently as to a regular total hip? I think I think that's a good question. And maybe that's someone one we could we could try to practice on now if you want. So do you wanna practice it? Do you wanna what ask me? Do you want me to ask you? I, I would ask you the question. Um, um, so if, if you're consenting this lady in clinic and she tells you, um, tell me about the total hip operation. Uh, what are my what are the benefits? Of course she knows the benefits. We told her about it. And what are the risks? I, I would I would consent her normally as a hip replacement without going into the details. But the part I would do differently is I would number one tell her that my main concern is longevity of the implant. Uh, she is only a thirty year old lady, and uh, she is at a very high risk of requiring further surgeries throughout her lifetime. Uh, we know that if a hip replacement is done before the age of 50 years, she's about eight times more risk of requiring a revision throughout her lifetime. Um, and from the surgical point of view, she has at higher risk of developing complications, including blood loss, particularly if we do a femoral osteotomy, developing uh, periprothetic fractures because of the tight femoral canal, and developing nerve or vascular injuries. Perhaps I can't give her uh, uh, specific numbers because each case is different depending on the complexity. Uh, but yeah, these are my concerns. I, I, I agree. Um, I, think, I think that's, that's the, uh, the way I would approach um, um, that kind of scenario in clinic. Yep. Do you think differently, Ahmed? Uh, no, I think more or less he covered everything. He um, he made the patient fully aware that it's not straightforward surgery, which she, she needs to know. And uh, obviously the risk of all the complications, although we don't have exact numbers, but the risk of all the complications being a challenging surgery are increased. So uh, I think uh, he set her expectations. So I think that's it. Okay. So what we need to sort of, what we did in this case is we appreciated, I think, the complexity, and that's what Ahmed Sami did. And he identified the challenges. He proposed solutions for each challenge. Um, he might not be aware of the technical details behind each solution, but I think from our experience from the FRCS exam, uh, this is m as much knowledge as you need to know to score a seven or an eight. Um, 
and he tried to uh, bring up the evidence behind it. I think this is the paper he was referring to. Um, it's a, one of these classic papers, so it's from 1988, um, and it identifies the predictors of loosening um, in uh, dysplastic hip replacements, and the most important predictors were the uh, bony support of the socket, the preoperative degree of hip dislocation, and the position of the socket relative to the true acetabulum. So sockets which were closer to the true acetabulum uh, performed and survived uh, longer than ones which were uh, of a high hip center. Okay. Uh, ju just a quick reflection on the difficult cases, whether viva or the clinical cases that you come across in your FRCS, whether you practice or your actual exam. My advice generally is don't panic. Uh, the examiner is well aware that you might have not at all seen these type of patients or been involved in their management which is perfectly fine and perfectly understandable. And this is the difference between exit exams, for example, in, in different countries and the FRCS. So you're meant to be a day one consultant in a GGH. So you have to be a safe surgeon, know the general rules and principles, but you're not expected to know the absolute details of every single uh, surgery or every single uh, disease, especially if it's not that common and you don't come across so you be grilled in hip arthritis, but when it comes to, um, to dysplasia or protrusio or other less common stuff, you want, you, if you say just the bare minimum, you will be surprised that you get a good six or seven. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Thank you, everyone.